I'm live. Am I live? Am I live? I think I'm. I think I'm live. Wonderful. I am live. Excellent. So, anyways, the Ozma of Oz deep dive, where I'm I'm covering Ozma of Oz for multiple reasons. This is kind of a tricky to deal with because I'm trying to do this for multiple reasons. So I'm really going to start with the sort of stuff that is handy for my students. Uh, Ozma of Oz is the book that I would be discussing with my students at this point in the semester. Um, uh, so I want to start with stuff that they it would come in handy for them so I could use it for my class. Um, because, you know, they're, you know, full disclosure, they're probably going to watch, you know, just a little bit of this, if they watch it at all, who knows? <laughs> probably watch the first few minutes of this. Um, so what I really want to talk about, I want to talk about these obscure characters named Smith and Tinker. Um, they show up for like a couple of paragraphs in this book, but they're just the most fascinating characters to me. I never get to talk about them because they're such minor characters. But I think it's a it's a really interesting thing to talk about from the perspective of what if you're going to write an essay on this? A, you know, if you're gonna write an essay on Ozma Voss, which my students might do, um, who knows at this point? <laughs> hopefully they hopefully they'll turn their essays in um, one of these days. Um, but they have a compare and contrast that they'll do. So, you know, if you took like Wonderful Wizard of Oz and you compared it to Ozma of Oz, you know, uh, how do you, how would you really organize that? Because Wonderful Wizard of Oz is a very tightly, a tightly structured book, not perfectly tightly structured, but it is a very tightly structured book. There's very little of it that doesn't have some sort of purpose in the grand story. Whereas Ozma of Oz is a very loosely structured book with all kinds of randomness. I love the randomness just on a purely personal level, but the challenge of writing about it is how do you deal with the randomness? We started with Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, and this is arguably the one that is structured the most like Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. Um, it essentially starts the plot in the second half of the book, but um, Alice's Adventures in Wonderland has no plot really, arguably, um, but this one really essentially starts the, the plot in, uh, in the second half of the book. But he throws in all these these wild random things just all over the place. So I do want to talk about you know how how much you approach that and organize that you know the randomness into um, something that makes kind of makes sense. Uh, but then in the second half, you know probably when my students dropped out anyway, um, I, I want to talk about what what you can learn from that uh, as as a writer because that's you know that's my main interest. Creative writing, creative writing is my field. Um, so I, I do like to talk about reading literature, but my, my passion, the love of my life is writing literature, writing, writing fiction. Um, so I do want to talk about, there's, there's, uh, one of the cliches that you always hear, um, from writing classes and stuff like that is kill your darlings, which is patently not true and deeply offensive to me as a human being. Um, and so, you know, Smith and Tinker functions as a perfect refutation of that idea. So just as a starting point, I do want to talk about Smith and Tinker. What if you what if you're writing an essay about a book that throws incredibly random things all over the place? How would you take that and organize that? But here's Smith and Tinker. This is the brief amount of time that Smith and Tinker show up in this book. This is in the chapter Dorothy opens the dinner pail for those of you who are just joining us the millions and millions of fans out there who are just joining us um Dorothy crashed on the the beach of the kingdom of Ev um which is just one it's a kingdom very near Oz it's you know bordering on Oz across the deadly desert from Oz um and she has a talking chicken with her that's really all you need to know <laughs> She encounters weird things in the kingdom of Ev um, with this talking chicken named Belina. And so here is the part where Smith and Tinker comes up. She meets um, TikTok, who is a robot, one of the first robots in literature. This is um, this is TikTok. This is a picture of TikTok holding it up there for a little while because my friend Buffy requested that I hold up the illustrations a little bit longer so that my millions of fans can look at them. Okay, is that enough? Okay, <laughs> we'll see. So they meet TikTok, who's just hanging out. Um, and Dorothy and TikTok just have these long conversations. Um, 
Belina and I mean, a lot of the book is just Dorothy talking to Belina and then Dorothy talking to TikTok. That's just a big chunk of the book is just these conversations. I love them. I'm just saying, <laughs> you know, in terms of plot, it, that's why I would say it's much more similar to Alice's Adventures in Wonderland than the Wonderful Wizard of Oz was because you have a definite goal right at the beginning of Wonderful Wizard of Oz. What is Dorothy's goal right now? Well, she's, you know, she's um, sort of lost, but not really. Um, you know, it says right at the beginning, she's too confident as an adventurer to really worry too much about being in this, you know, in this strange land. So, you know, that that sort of tension is just not not there in this one. Um, but anyway, so she's having this conversation with TikTok, the robot. Um, before the word robot ever came into existence, you know, that's just an interesting bit of trivia. Doesn't really matter that much, but predates the word robot, which came in the 20s, like 23 or something like that. This is 19, 1912. I forget what the, when this one came out, 1912, maybe 1911, something like that. Book, book two came out in 1907. So this one might've been 1909 or something. Anyway, that doesn't matter. I lost me talking about the year this came out. I lost all my viewers that way. Um, so <laughs> I don't really, I don't really care that much. But, um, but anyway, she's having this conversation with TikTok. Um, uh, Dorothy says, "You seem very durable," said Dorothy. "Who, who made you?" And then TikTok said, "I'm not going to do the robot voice, but uh, Bomb does sort of this." Um, this very choppy dialogue with TikTok. Um, the firm of Smith and Tinker in the town of Evna, where the royal palace stands, answered TikTok. Do they make many of you? asked the child. No, I am the only automatic mechanical man they ever completed, he replied. They were very wonderful inventors, were my makers and quite artistic in all they did. I'm sure, I'm sure of that, said Dorothy. Do they live in the town of Evna now? They are both gone, replied the machine. Mr. Smith was an artist as well as an inventor, and he painted a picture of a river which was so natural that, as he was reaching across it to paint some flowers on the opposite bank, he fell into the water and was drowned. That's it for Mr. Smith. I mean, this is the fascinating thing about this character. Here's a brand new crazy idea that just comes in kind of randomly and then disappears from the book completely. Um, you know, never really explored again that I know of. I mean, maybe after the 14, they come back to Smith and Tinker. Uh, Mr. Tinker, continued TikTok, made a ladder so tall that he could rest the end of it against the moon while he stood on the highest rung and picked the little stars to set in the points of the king's crown. Isn't that lovely? <laughs> I just love that part. It's very, very brief in the whole book, and it's never really explained that much more. He's climbing this tall ladder up to the moon, wants to pick stars. That works in Oz, I guess. Um, but when he got to the moon, Mr. Tinker found it such a lovely place that he decided to live there. So he pulled up the ladder after him and we have never seen him since. Just a lovely little paragraph. Doesn't play out at all at, at anywhere else. There's really no payoff for that. There's no explanation. There's no world building. So apparently Oz is this place where, that's my dog, <laughs> Maggie. Maggie's making noise with her collar. Maggie, come here. I'm sure that's some mysterious sound if you didn't realize there was a dog sitting there. There's a dog sitting there. Hey, Maggie, say hello. If you were in Oz, you would be able to say hello. Anyway, um, so apparently in Oz, animals uh, talk. That plays out in some complicated ways. But also in Oz, um, oh, here comes a cat. There you go. <laughs> also in Oz, the moon is a whole civilization, which is so lovely that it convinces Mr. Tinker to just stay there and he can live. Fascinating. Never pans out. <laughs> There's nothing else. There's nothing else that happens um, in regard to that. So, you know, one of my favorite parts of the of this book, certainly, you know, in the whole Oz series, here comes guest appearance by Bo. And she's leaving. 
Okay. <laughs> One of my favorite parts of the whole Oz series, and it's just kind of this random reference, but Bond will do that all the time. He'll just throw in, here's a very complicated concept. It's like the Danny China country. I never talk about the Danny China country, but that's a, that's a whole part of book one that just kind of comes in such a random spot in the whole book. It's a great little scene, but it's, it just, you know, there's not much payoff to it. It's in this, I mean, for the arc of the story as a whole, you know, if you think about, I'm going to organize this essay talking about wonderful wisdom of Oz. Um, you, you know, you could certainly, I mean, I've talked about this with my class, but you could certainly say, um, here, are, here are the different arcs that lead the characters to this particular end. They ultimately help fulfill this plot point of wanting to get home. All of all four of the main characters have this definite desire that is ultimately fulfilled. They have this fake sort of fulfillment in the middle. I still have people that really get stuck on this idea that the, the companions fulfill their desires in the middle of the book when they get the stuff from the wizard. This is how deeply entrenched the movie is. Um, my cat is over there making noise. If you hear some noise, this is how deeply entrenched the movie is, is uh, people have this, um, still have just totally stuck in this belief that, um, that by the wizard giving them these fake objects, they actually, they actually achieve what they want. But you definitely have a desire. All four of the main characters have this desire. Um, they have this this goal that they will reach their desire. Um, they have this means by which they could reach their desire. Um, they have these obstacles in the way, and then they achieve it. So it's that's what I would call a tightly constructed plot. Um, so if you're if you're organizing an analysis of that, you would say you would um, you would look at that tightly constructed plot, and you would say, you know, here's what they desire. Here's how they try to get it. Here are the obstacles. And then on the deeper level, you would say, here's significant emotional motivation for why they want these desires. You know, the scarecrow has this deep insecurity um, that makes him think that he's not intelligent when he actually is. Um, he he uh, actually wants uh, affirmation from the public. Uh, and so his aim is to achieve this affirmation from the public with these objects, you know, that kind of thing. Um, this physical object, he ultimately learns he doesn't need the physical object by accepting, you know, overcoming his insecurities and accepting who he truly is and that sort of thing. You have those definite sort of beats where you can you can organize a fairly, fairly easily construct an analysis of that sort of tightly constructed plot. But then, you know, in book one, what do you do with the dainty China country? Doesn't really fit any of that. <laughs> but Bond will do this constantly. He'll, he'll throw in these um, he'll throw in these random sort of plot points that don't don't pay off at all. Danny, the Danny China Country in book one, it's a great chapter. It's it's funny, it's enjoyable, it's entertaining, but very infrequently does it really work for an analysis. So you would just kind of cut that out of an analysis. And that works fine because essentially your aim is, is you know, your aim is to look at a character's development. So you would look at the scarecrow and you would say, here's, you know, here's how the scarecrow fulfills his, his desire, what have you. Um, and then just, you know, sort of leave out um, you know, any sort of conversation about the Danish China country. Um, but that's, you know, that's one of the big differences in, in writing an essay and writing a, writing a story. Your ultimate goal is sort of this efficient coverage of, of, um, a very complicated story with multiple elements. So if you can justify leaving something out, um, you know, it's perfectly justifiable because your purpose is to, cover this sort of reasonable analysis of, of a very complicated sort of a thing. Uh, so there's a lot of, <laughs> I have a dog barking at me for no reason. Speaking of random things, my dog Siku likes to bark at me for no reason. You hush, I'm trying to talk, you silly boy. Um, <laughs> so anyway, where was I? Uh, hush. But you make these compromises, you know, so if you think about if you're analyzing a human being and somebody's emotional motivation, um, they're, they're ultimately paradoxical and they have these direct contradictions. If you're really trying to simplify that, if your purpose was to give a simple sort of analysis of a human being and, you know, acknowledge and recognize their contradictions, sometimes you just ultimately have to make compromises and leave out some some complicated things. It's, you know, in good faith, you would, you would say there are these contradictory elements, but ultimately in the aggregate, this is, you know, my analysis of this human being's motivation, but human beings are much more complicated than that. Um, there's my, there's my, uh, sermon for the day. Human beings are too complicated to 
easily analyzed. But if you're writing a relatively short essay, like a four or six page essay or something like that, that's all. That's what you have to do. Sometimes you just have to leave leave parts out. So you know, analyzing a book is like analyzing a human being. So it's you know, the book is going to have random parts like the Danny China Country uh, or like Smith and Tinker. So here's one way that I would break it down. Let me see if I can get this on camera. <laughs> here's one way I would break it down. Um, the thematizing, I uh, th theming, theming. I have a love-hate relationship with theming. Um, a lot of high school, uh, hopefully it's not turned backwards in the video. If it's turned backwards, hopefully you're good at reading things backwards. And hopefully Bo doesn't erase it with her face. Please don't erase that with your face. Are you gonna erase that with your face? Please don't erase that with your face. Anyway, I have a love-hate relationship with theming. Uh, a lot of high schools teach theming. Um, and I, I, I tend to be bothered by teaching theming without a license is what I call it. You know, theme, theming, usually, uh, you know, a lot of times in high school literature classes, they'll teach students to um, identify what's true in all cases, identify something that something that's always true. How does this demonstrate something that's always true? So they'll, they'll teach them like human condition stuff. I'm always Annoyed by human condition sort of statements in uh, literary analysis. It's the human condition to desire something that my dogs are fighting outside. It's a, the dog condition to fight for no reason. Anyway, so it's a human condition to desire something, you know, outside of your reach or what have you. Uh, usually that kind of theming tends to be either unsupported generalization and a faulty argument. That's part of my problem with that kind of theming. Megan Seagull, stop, stop fighting. I'm trying to talk and you will never stop making noise while I'm talking. So anyway, that kind of theming, um, you know, usually you'd ha you have to have some sort of support for that. I would argue you need some kind of support for theming where, where you're making, where you're making generalizations about humanity. So like my class, we talk about uh, mad woman in the attic, something like that. Um, you know, you're making a you're making a claim about how male writers depict female characters. But if you look at Gilbert and Gubar, what they do in that book is they cover just a large number of pieces. I'm not expecting, you know, a freshman to cover a thousand pieces, but Gilbert and Gubar do that. And so therefore, they're able to come up with a logical conclusion based on observations of, you know, how many ever thousands of pieces. It seems like thousands of pieces in the book. Or we talk about Hero's Journey. So Hero's Journey. Um, Joseph Campbell's able to come up with, you know, a valid sort of claim about common patterns in hero stories because he looks at thousands of hero stories. So, you know, a lot of a lot of uh, high school teachers will say, what's the human condition? Uh, you know, asking high school students, what is the human condition uh, apparent in this book? Um, and so a lot of times they get stuck in that kind of analysis, which is an ineffective way of approaching theming, if you ask me. Um, what I would argue is a much more effective way of approaching theming, and this goes for if you're writing analysis of a piece of fiction or if you're writing a piece of fiction, uh, I would say uh, aesthetic theming is far more effective in understanding how the piece works, uh, but also in um, creating a piece. So aesthetic theming, theming versus rhetorical theming. This is the way a lot of people teach theming. Rhetorical theming, you know, you you're stringing together a lot of ideas and idea, the ideas could be things like, you know, what, like I said, human condition, what, uh, what should, it could be like lessons, for example, you know, and those arguments about, you know, uh, like dehumanization, for example, it just shows up just constantly throughout Osmo of Oz. There's all kinds of images of dehumanization. Um, uh, so you could say, you could turn that into a rhetorical theme and you could say, Osma Vaz argues that we shouldn't dehumanize people. Um, now I would argue against that as, as an effective analysis of Osma Vaz merely because it is inconsistent. However, I definitely agree we should not dehumanize people. You know, that sometimes gets mixed up when I talk about this, when I say, um, you know, over, oh, uh, Broad generalizations are ineffective analysis, you know, things like lessons are ineffective analysis. You know, when I say stuff like that, people tend to say, oh, you think we should dehumanize people. That's not what I'm saying at all. Dehumanization is bad, definitely bad. 
not what I'm arguing a bit. But I'm saying if you if you take something like Osmo and Oz and you say rhetoric, the rhetorical theme is that um, that we shouldn't dehumanize people. It's very inconsistent. It's linked by consistent argument. It's very inconsistent, so it undermines that that particular idea. So you know that tends to lead you to have to ignore the inconsistencies in the argument. However, if you think of it as aesthetic theming, um, what you're linking is images. It doesn't have to be images. It could be lots of different things. You're linking image, 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 image. Um, so your or image or plot point, or it could be a lot of different things. Um, so what really ties them together? Um, there's an aesthetic tie at that point. Um, an aesthetic ties, there's no real necessity to be consistent. Um, there's just a there's just a necessity <laughs> to elicit emotions. Here we go. Here's where the rainbow circle comes in. This is why I always start with in the rainbow circle, or for my students, I just call it the seven analytical levels. This is why I always start with the visceral. Um, because you know, if you talk about aesthetic theming, what is aesthetic theming? Arguably, aesthetic theming is just um, eliciting emotions. You know, what sort of image elicits a particular emotion on the irrational level? So, if you consider that sort of link of seemingly disconnected image as aesthetic theming, linked only by parataxis. Parataxis, I think, if you're going to understand how any sort of artworks or any sort of poetry or fiction works, parataxis is a key vocab word it's essential parataxis just means uh the juxtaposition of seemingly disconnected images without a directly stated connection <laughs> juxtaposition you know sometimes i have to explain m multiple parts of the definition but juxtaposition you mean means just putting two things together that don't seem to belong together uh so how does parataxis work you put things that don't seem to belong together together and it creates this emotional response so if you encounter something that's really chaotic and you're trying to really analyze it, how do you really analyze it and organize it together? Well, you recognize what is the um, what is the emotional response that that we can pull from from that. So I would add that emo emotion emotional response. There you go, emotional response. Right with Dorothy's poor missing leg. <laughs> Here's Thanos saying, "I will destroy you all." I don't know why I gave him a high voice. Um, Here's Frank Sinatra approving of everything I'm saying. But anyway, so, oh, no, oh, Scarecrow. There's Scarecrow over there. We're all mad here. Here's Alice. So, um, what was I saying? So, the aesthetic theme. So, the emotional response. So, if you tie it together with by recognizing what sort of emotional response is consistent throughout the, the text, recognizing the complexity of the emotional response and all the contradictions of the emotional response, then ultimately, in that sort of uh, approach to the theming of the text, then you can, then there's no real necessity to be consistent. If it's rhetoric, so that's the key there. If it's rhetorical theming, there is a necessity to be consistent. Otherwise it's going to undermine the argument. Aesthetic theming, uh, there's no real need for any sort of consistency because parataxis uh, derives a lot of its power from um, the lack of clarity of connection. So Here's where Smith and Tinker comes in. <laughs> I'm gonna get back to Smith and Tinker. Smith and Tinker, one of my favorite parts of Ozma Boss. But Smith and Tinker, um, if you think about what is the emotion of Smith and Tinker, it's it's a really quick, random sort of part of the whole book. Um, but it but they just sort of come in there and then they die. <laughs> so, so you have Smith uh, who paints a painting who that's so so realistic that he falls in and he drowns. That's just a real sudden, random emotional moment right there. This is uh, uh, TikTok's creator. One of TikTok's creators is so amazingly skilled as an artist to create something as realistic as a painting that he can drown in, and then he drowns in it. That's just a sudden burst of this emotional uh, uh, stimulation. Uh, how does that connect with the rest of it? Well, logically, it doesn't connect. Um, you know, there's no real clear logical connection to the Smith and Tinker story. Um, but there's real no, really no necessity for a logical connection. <laughs> there you go. Because there's an aesthetic connection. Um, this parallels, I mean, certainly if you look at Smith and Tinker, or any, you know, so many of the random, there's so many very, very random things happening in the book. But if you look at Smith and Tinker or any of, of the other really random stuff going on, um, 
And you said, what sort of emotion uh, does that elicit? Well, Smith uh, is uh, so focused on his art form that he dies and abandons his creation. Um, parallel that with the King of Ev. The King of Ev is as a plot point. TikTok is kind of a uh, exposition machine, basically. But um, you parallel the Smith with um, the King of Ev. The King of Ev sells his kids to the Gnome King for uh, extended life. And then he just jumps in the ocean and dies. Um, well, <laughs> there that's an aesthetic parallel. Um, what sort of emotion does Smith elicit? He elicits the emotion of abandonment of, you know, of a creator for his creation. Um, what sort of emotion does the, the King of Ev elicit? He abandons his children and he has this irony of, you know, totally eliminating his, his, um, whatever, I mean, if the Gnome King actually gave him the gift of immortality, he's, he's abandoning his children. Um, he's abandoning life, you know, he's giving up on what, you know, he becomes so obsessed with, um, becomes so obsessed with, um, long life that he sells, you know, he goes to the, such great monomaniacal links, great, I mean, in terms of extreme, I should say, not great, extreme monomaniacal links of achieving immortality that he's a, he's willing to give up his children, he's willing to give up everything, and then he just, you know, throws himself in the ocean. So you have, you know, the visual of falling into water that is paralleled, uh, but you also have the emotion of abandonment that's paralleled, even though the stories are quite different. So as an argument that's inconsistent, but as as an aesthetic parallel, it's very consistent. Um, and then you have Tinker who climbs to the moon to serve the King of Ev, to give him these stars, um, give him the, this gift. Um, but then he finds that it's so beautiful up there that he stays there. Um, and he, you know, he invented this ladder that could reach the moon, but he ultimately that leads to him abandoning earth. Um, so you have that abandonment once again, um, where, you know, uh, the emotional response, you know, is, is consistent. If you think about those three things, the emotional response is consistent, even though the story is quite different. Uh, what is the emotional response of, um, Tinker abandoning TikTok? Um, you would expect it to be, you know, this sort of devastating sense of abandonment. Um, TikTok doesn't really, I mean, arguably, TikTok doesn't really feel emotions. You get really, you know, hints of, of his emotional responses, but you really don't get a whole lot of direct overt sort of emotional response. He'll say things like they're great artists and stuff like that, but he doesn't really, um, you know, he doesn't really cry for them or anything like that. He doesn't really express any sort of emotions for um for the creators who abandoned them, ba abandon him is still a sad image, though. It's still a sad image of the abandonment of a creation. Um, but then you have uh, TikTok discussing, you know, what it means to be human. And I think a lot of the emotional impact that you can get from TikTok is the similarity he has to the Tin Man. And the Tin Man is overly emotional about everything, but doesn't think of himself as being a human being. You have the opposite of that with TikTok, who's not emotional about anything, has no ambitions to be more human um, and it's just wants to be programmed. And so his tragedy is that he has to be programmed by someone else is that he is an object with no one to give him any sort of direction. So he's entirely directionless and unfettered. Um, and, but you have the complete opposite of that in so many other ways where um, in the King of Ev, for example, the King of Ev uh, sells his kids to the Gnome King. The Gnome King turns them into objects, turns them into, trinkets and tick and, and knickknacks and bric-a-brac and all those other weird words for uh, unimportant objects um but and so that's essentially the opposite the tragedy is that he's turned he's turned his children into uh objects um and just abandoned them um the flip side of that is with smith and tinker smith and tinker abandoned tiktok um but he has no problem with being an object, but his tragic situation is that he's an object without someone to um, give him programming. So he's, lo he's lost. So you have these two lot, TikTok essentially the child of Smith and Tinker, totally lost um, without his creation. You have the children of, of the King of Ev, the royal family of Ev. They're lost without their father, but in terms of objects and subjects, 
you know, if we if we just looked at it in terms of rhetorical rhetorical theming, uh, we would say, don't turn people into objects. But how did how do you really apply that to Smith and Tinker and TikTok when he is an object and he's fine with that? You know, I'm not arguing in favor of turning anyone into objects. I'm just saying. Rhetorically, it's inconsistent. Aesthetically, it's totally consistent. And you get that with Alice in Wonderland. I mean, that's we start off talking about Alice in Wonderland. You get that just constantly with Alice in Wonderland, where Alice is extremely inconsistent in any sort of position that she takes. Um, and I have a lot of students who fixate on her, her maturity, but um, you know, is she actually on a journey towards maturity? You know, that that sort of that sort of rhetorical approach where you say. Uh, Alice is on a journey. I, I try to discourage them from talking about maturity because um, it's definitely an inconsistent rhetorical analysis. Whereas if you said, here's Alice's emotions, you're able to have a very consistent aesthetic theme because um, Alice is desperate to make friends with people and she struggles with that. What is the emotional response from that? Misery, that's pretty consistent. The misery develops into anger. That's really consistent aesthetically. But if you said Alice needs to learn how to fill in the blank in order to be mature. She needs to learn how to stand up for herself in order to be mature. Um, the way she stands up for herself is not really consistently mature. So you have to create a really tight sort of rhetorical analysis about, about what maturity means. And that and a lot of times in that kind of theme, I mean, this is a lot of the ways people teach literature in high school that, that you know, um, I have trouble with, but um, you have to start off with a consistent, comprehensive definition of what maturity means and then apply it to each of the situations consistently for it to really work effectively as, as a rhetorical theme. Whereas if you just said, here's Alice's emotional response, works perfectly fine um, because she's a complicated character. She has these complicated emotions. Um, rarely, do I, rarely do I teach without shoes on, <laughs> almost never, but now I'm teaching without shoes on. Rarely do I ever teach with dogs all around me, and I have dogs all around me right now. But anyway, so there's that. That's the part that hopefully comes in handy for my students. I don't know. Maybe watch one of these and you get a lecture on Ozma Vaz, um, similar to the one that I would do in class if we had class at the moment. Um, but I also, you know, creative writing is my field. That That's what I'm obsessed with. So I do want to add something just on the flip side of that. Um, what you might take from Smith and Tinker in terms of, of creating a story. Um, that's how you would consider something like that in terms of analyzing a story. Um, but in creating a story, um, a lot of my problems with my own history of creative writing education, I've, I've, I've struggled with creative writing education and I learned very little and it always bothered me how they taught creative writing education. It's sort of like if I if I was going in for, you know, a, a, a graduate degree in literary analysis and they taught high school type of theming, um, that type of theming that really bothers me. Um, that happened with creative writing education in graduate school as well. But anyway, so a lot of the problem was reliance on entirely inaccurate cliches and cliches that are either harmful or offensive or com completely wrong uh, in some ways. Some of them are fine uh, just on in the short term, but you know that that substituted for any sort of wisdom. Um, but one of the ones I hated most. It's hard. It's hard to really identify my least favorite creative writing education cliche, but probably one that I hated the most is "Kill Your Darlings." But the idea of "Kill Your Darlings." Um, is contradictory to what I was just saying about aesthetic theming. Um, with uh, Kill Your Darlings, the basic idea there is um, um, is that if you have something in the story that's not working, cut it out. And so the, the phrasing it as Kill Your Darlings, the idea is that you're attached to this, this thing that's not working, um, and you need to detach yourself from this thing that's not working and, and cut it out. And it seems like fine advice. It's terrible advice, but it's, it, it disguises itself as good advice. Um, but my response to that is always, why, why do you have anything in your story that's not a darling 
And I, it's sort of like it, if you're um, trying to create an argument about maturity and you fail to provide a good, clear, accurate, and consistent definition of maturity up front, um, then you fail as a rhetorical argument. Mm -hmm. um, but that kill your darlings idea. <laughs> oh, it's still. Okay, there you go. <laughs> but the kill your darlings idea, the problem with the kill your darlings um, is what is a darling and what is not a darling? Are we arguing that the story should be all non-darlings? Um, are we arguing that we should write stories that we don't like? Why are we writing stories that we don't like? I would argue everything should be a darling. Don't kill your darlings. Make everything a darling. <laughs> Every single part of the story should be a darling. Um, anyway, that that cliche has always bothered me um, because if it's if you're not uh, writing something you enjoy, what are you what are you doing? Well, if you're not writing a story that you consider a darling that brings you joy, why are you doing it at all? Frankly, um, and, you know, even if you have some sort of agenda. Um, your darling is the agenda. Your your joy is the agenda. Um, I mean, kill your darlings would make sense if, you know, and I would argue against this, but kill your darlings would make some kind of sense if all stories had a function other than just the joy of storytelling. Um, I would argue that's the core. <laughs> I would argue that's the core value. Visceral analysis, I mean, visceral, visceral stimulation. Um, but even if you argue that it has um, some sort of rhetorical function outside of just, you know, pure visceral stimulation, that is a darling. I mean, that's <laughs> if you're if you're arguing for social change, you know, you you're you know, why would you argue for it unless it's unless it's some sort of joy, maybe not pleasure, but it's some sort of some sort of you know, joy out of that, whether it's the joy of improving the world or other some other kind of joy. Um, joy is, I mean, this is sort of my argument about, uh, emotional, uh, stimulation of the text and the complexity of emotions and analysis of emotions. Joy is a complicated idea. Enjoying something and loving something is a complicated idea. You can have various types of joy. Why would you kill any of them? That's, you know, that's my problem with it. Um, so, um, and I thought about this a lot when I, I was listening to the, uh, Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows with my son, Callum, who guest starred on the first episode of Ozma Deep Dive. You need a hush. This is a darling. I'm gonna muzzle that darling. I'm gonna muzzle that darling because he won't shut up. But I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna muzzle you. I'm kidding. But why are you barking at me? Well, anyway, <laughs> I'm gonna try to talk with a dog in my face. <laughs> anyway, that's a joy. Um, Darlings can be frustrating, um, but they're still darlings. Anyway, um, so kill your darlings. Yeah. Anyway, I thought about this with the Deathly Hallows. Um, Hallows, Hallows, Hallows. The last in the Harry Potter series, I was listening to that. Callum and I were doing the whole audiobook series, and we just finished it up. And the Deathly Hallows has so many darlings. I thought, you know, if, if, if you had workshop that that would that would be certainly one of the things people would say and a lot of times when a writer becomes successful like Stephen King for example um, they'll pack their book with a lot of darlings um, and, but that's their their right to you know I'm not gonna argue that you know someone with an aesthetic vision I'm not gonna say you enjoy this thing you should you should cut it out um, but I, I just imagined it with the Deathly Hallows hey babe what's that you're a little dementor right now I just imagine with uh, the Deathly Hallows, <laughs> she's going to get in my lap, that um, what would it be like if you cut out uh, some of the plot? There's just so much plot in that book. What, it, what would it be like if you cut out some of the plot? So like, you know, spoiler alert, I guess, but um, if you don't want me to spoil the last book in the Harry Potter series, but uh, what would it be? <laughs> would it be like, you, so you have seven Horcruxes, you know, that's a big part of the plot. You have three Deathly Hallows, Plus you have the sort of Gryffindor. You have just all of these objects. So if you talk about like a heroic story and the role of objects, that's just common. I mean, you get, you know, so many boons and elixirs and things like that. But I was trying, as I was listening to it, I was trying to think, 
you know, probably somebody would say kill your darlings with this one because there's just so many objects. Just that one element. If you said there's so many objects, cut out some of these objects. Would it be better? Maybe. Uh, it would be more efficient. So by better, I'm saying the better there would be more efficient. What I would argue is that the ultimate goal is emotional stimulation. My dog is about to lick me in the face. Don't lick me in the face right now. <laughs> emotional stimulation is the goal. So if you have multiple darlings and one of the darlings is an obstacle to that emotional stimulation, cut that darling out. So let's say hypothetically, Deathly Hallows. If you had a version of the Deathly Hallows where it was seven Horcruxes, <laughs> seven Horcruxes, three Deathly Hallows, sort of Gryffindor, it was so many objects and a hundred characters or whatever. So maybe a version with so many different elements, compare that to, let's say, what if we had like a story about three Horcruxes and that was it, you know, that's a more efficient story. And in that case, I would be defining, I would be defining aesthetic quality with, you know, equating that with efficiency. And that's a lot, a lot of what happens in my experience in creative writing education, unfortunately. Um, but if I compare those two and I said the emotional stimulation of seven Horcruxes and three Deathly Hallows, that's more emotional stimulation than the, the three Horcruxes or whatever, the more efficient version. In that case, I would say it would make sense for me to, to pare down my darlings. <laughs> Don't kill your darlings, pare them down, cut them out in order to enhance emotional stimulation. If, if that's the goal. Uh, but I mean, that was sort of my response is that um, the emotional stimulation of the Deathly Hallows, a lot of it comes from, just the desperation um, to, you know, kill, kill Voldemort. Does having so many objects dilute that, you know? Um, and that's true, like, with all the different deaths in that book, for example. Does each death dilute the emotional impact of the next death or what have you? Just as an example. But compare that to the Oz series. Um, you have wonderful Wizard of Oz, um, you know, fairly tightly structured plot. Then you have random things like the Dandy China Country. Um, would the third leg of the journey work better without the Dandy China Country? Yeah, probably. Um, but what I would say, you know, what I would say was something like that. I mean, if, if from the perspective of a writer, what I would say was something like that is probably the Dandy China Country does not work for that book. I would cut out the Dandy China Country in book one and see if it works better without the Dandy China Country if the emotional stimulation is enhanced without the Danny China country. And if so, I would go with that version, but, and listen carefully, Maggie, are you listening? Are you listening? Okay. But <laughs> if I, if I had a looser structure plot, which is entirely a valid uh, choice of a writer, uh, if I had a loosely structured plot, like Ozma of Oz is much looser structure uh, of a plot. Alice's Adventure in Wonderland. Very, very loosely structured plot. Um, if I were to, you know, have something like the Dane in China Country just pop up randomly in Ozma Vaz, boom, in my face right now, thank you. If I had, if I had that one of those random elements just pop up in, in one of those more loosely structured books, um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say kill your darlings there because it's all, you know, that's the, the schematically, schematically there you go a schematically just the structure of the book uh and it is consistent and it's less likely to really undermine the emotional impact of the text um so if you have something like Ozma of Oz which with so many random things that with no payoff at all I mean if you think about the Alice books there's set up there's a lot of setup there's very little payoff um if you talk about payoff what's the what's the actual pay, payoff in the Alice series <laughs> sit down there you go was the actual payoff in the Alice series? Um, you know, very little payoff, but that's not a flaw. That's just that's an aesthetic choice. Um, would having a tightly constructed plot in the Alice books increase emotional stimulation? Um, I mean, look at the Tim Burton version. Personally, <laughs> not a big fan of the Tim Burton version. That doesn't. You know, I have students who present on the Tim Burton version all the time. Um, that's not, and I have students vote on which ones to, for us to watch. That's not going to affect at all how I grade any sort of presentation like that. 
It's not going to affect the vote at all. I'm just saying, on an entirely personal level, I think that's a flawed story. But anyway, um, but you end up with something like that. I mean, the Tim Burton version is a tightly constructed plot. Is that a better plot than the original one? Well, no, it's just a very different sort of aesthetic. So if you have something like um, Ozma Vaz and you have the introduction of TikTok, there's really no payoff with TikTok. Um, he's just a robot. <laughs> Randomly, this story has a robot. Um, there's payoff with Belina, but Belina sort of drops out of the story for a huge chunk of it. But there's payoff at the end. Um, spoiler alert on that, I guess. But um, but what I say, you know, like the, the Smith and Tinker part, it's just a beautiful part. You know, it enhances the book for me because it's just this random, beautiful part. TikTok enhances the book because he's this really compelling character that shows up kind of randomly. The Hungry Tiger has no payoff. Princess Languideer is just this really brief part of the book with no payoff, arguably. Um, there's so many of these random parts in the book with no payoff. Um, would I kill my darlings in that case? Well, no, of course I wouldn't kill my darlings in that case at all. I would never kill my darlings, period. But um, would I say, you know, cut out Smith and Tinker? Well, no, I definitely would not do that. But if it was a more tightly constructed plot, I would say Smith and Tinker is this beautiful thing. Uh, make a whole different book about it. I would love to read a book about Smith and Tinker, but Smith and Tinker is this, you know, this beautiful little random side plot that just pro crops up suddenly and um, leaves. It's distracting. Do a different story about it. That's ten that tends to be how I do it. If, I, if something pops up that I like and it doesn't really fit that story, I'll just do a different story about it. You imagine, here's my lesson for, <laughs> I'm going to wrap it up, but here's my lesson for all of all of you kids out there in in YouTube land and Facebook land, um, you know, if you're creative, there are no limitations whatsoever. If your goal is visceral stimulation, I mean, there's a practical way to achieve that, and there's ways to to um, undermine that, but there's really no limitation. So if you if you have a little story element that doesn't fit in a story, write a whole other story about it. There's really no limitations to that. But anyway, I will wrap it up for today. Oh, get down, Maggie. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for joining us for Ozma, Ozma Vaz Deep Dive. Uh, and I will see you on the next episode. I might be reading chapters three and four. We'll see um, if Calum is with me. Uh, he's not with me today. Um, but I will read it with, with him. Uh, maybe next episode we'll see what else I, I'll do, um, depending on if he's with me. But let me know if you have any questions. I could talk about Oz all day, and I could also talk about aesthetics all day. Um, but anyway, see you on the next episode.